Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first in our soil and water week uh, management, soil and water management week installment, I guess is what we're calling this, um, that we decided that we really needed to touch on uh, this fall, considering how dry things have been and we're getting a lot of questions coming in regarding moisture status and what are some of the implications and what we need to be kind of thinking about um, this fall as we start preparing for next, next spring. So um, I want to introduce um, my panelists and you will end up seeing some of their faces probably on screen later on. Um, but uh, today and for the rest of this week, uh, those of us who are putting this together for you guys, we have Curtis Cavers, Kim Brown Livingston, John Hurd and myself, Marla Rickman. And again, we just wanted to be able to have some conversation with uh, everybody about how we're going to go through this fall, um, how we're going to get into next spring, and essentially what are some of the implications. So we have five days um, lined up for you, and each day is going to have somewhat of a theme. Uh, our first theme today being soil moisture status, we have too little, now what? And so Monday, just so you're aware, Monday today, we're going through some of the general implications of too little water. So we're going to talk today about where we're at with water status in Manitoba, um, and what some of this stuff means in terms of next year's crop potential, how much water crops need, and we'll also touch on salinity because you can't talk about having too little water without talking about salinity. Tomorrow, um, we're going to get into tillage and talk about tillage and soil erosion potential that we're seeing right now. On Wednesday, we're going to have uh, weed control and herbicide carryover and some of the things that we need to think about with regards to um, managing those weeds but keeping in mind uh, some of the implications again of if we're using say tillage to manage weeds uh, and then also some of the problems with these dry soils if we have herbicide carryover what that means for next year's crop. Thursday we're going to get into post drought soil fertility management so stay tuned for um, that on Thursday and then right now Friday is currently listed as a free-for-all so we don't know what kind of questions will come up, what kind of questions that you guys will have for us, and additional topics that may uh, kind of spark people's interest with regards to this kind of dry condition and soil and water management. So if things come up, we're going to throw them in on Friday. Uh, first thing, I'm going to uh, make sure that you guys know if you have questions for us, and we hope that you do, we're here for an hour and we want to answer whatever questions are coming in. If you have questions for us, you should see a uh, question tab on your screen. Um, there's the little red arrow that goes back and forth, so you can flip uh, back and forth to be able to see the control tab. Um, and if you go and open that up, you can see questions pop up. And if you see that question tab, that's the best place to be able to post questions to us. We can kind of manage them a little bit easier. You'll likely also see a chat box too. And so you can also uh, post things into the chat message as well. So you may have seen a message from me just pop up right now, re reminding you to go to the question tab to ask your questions. So as we get started, um, well, well, yes, John. Just a reminder that if we don't uh, if we don't get enough questions or if there aren't any topics, if you've done a great job and it's not required we meet Friday, it's a go fishing Friday. Yeah. Oh yeah, fishing Friday. Okay, so it won't be Friday fee free for all. We were trying to come up with um, alliterations for everything. So we were having some moisture Monday and tillage Tuesday and weeds Wednesday, but we couldn't think of what to do for soil fertility. So John is now trying to make up for that by allowing everybody to go fishing on Friday. Is that is that what you're trying to do, John? If we've got all the questions answered, that's what. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, it will be a free Friday, not just a free for all Friday if we've got questions. Um, and I'm going to let you know that we've already got people offering uh, to go fishing with you um, in the uh, question or chat box. So there you go. So it'll be a it'll be a fishing Friday option. Um, so what we do want to do is start off by talking about where we're even at. Um, and so this is the soil moisture status from last Monday's crop report or crop weather report. And so we have our last Tuesdays, I should say, we don't have the Monday status come out yet. We will be able to show this later on this week if people are looking for this information. But this is looking at the top four feet of current soil moisture status for Manitoba. 
and you'll see that there are areas that show up as very dry as well as dry um, through most of the Red River Valley and into the interlake is showing up in that orange color as dry, whereas Western Manitoba is considered optimal. Now, the categorization of optimal um, is actually looking at a range of water that is somewhere between avail uh, 50 percent of available water holding capacity up to field capacity. That's optimal for during crop growth. It might not be something we would consider to be optimal during harvest. It doesn't mean that it's too wet, um, but that's just something to keep in mind when these the word optimal is used. It's usually used with regards to thinking about it as moisture status for growing crop. But it does mean that we have a bit more moisture at depth in the Western part of the province. So I do wanna talk quickly about what this means when we talk about available water, just so everyone's on the same page. I know a lot of you have learned this before, um, but uh, when we have soil that is fully saturated, and that is the image that is on the right side of your screen, and you have those kind of dripping down, kind of water flowing through that area, when water is, or soil is fully saturated, all pores, big and little, throughout that soil uh, profile is full of water, and the water is freely able to flow through that, the large pores, um, uh, this idea of gravitational flow or water flowing downwards. At the other end, on the left-hand side, is where you have soil that is so dry, there is water there, but that water that's available, or that water that's there is not available for plant uptake. And that's because the water is sucked, basically sucked on so tightly into the tiny little pores or around those uh, soil particles that it can't be given up to a plant. And in between that, so where we, we look at between field capacity and permanent wilting point, when we talk about available water, it's the amount of water that the soil can hold after it's been allowed to freely drain and until it dries so much that any water that's left is held on so tightly it can't be given up. So essentially plant available water is water held in the soil in smaller pores um, that can be sucked out by a plant root essentially. So that's what we talk about with regards to available water. Now the amount of available water will change based on or the total amount that can be held in a soil will change based on the soil texture. So when we deal with clay soils, um, so up in this range, they can hold a lot of water at field capacity, essentially, um, but they also can hold a whole lot of water at permanent wilting point. So they've got so many of those small clay particles and films that water can like be held onto so tight. The actual total available water is all, not always that high compared to maybe a loam or a silt loam um, where the field capacity and permanent wilting point are lower, but the difference between them is that much greater. So there's potentially more available water. So this is something to keep in mind when we start talking about what available water is. And if you think about that map that we were just showing, that map is looking at basically how much water is available, but it's going to differ across the province, the total amount, based on what that soil texture is at that point in the province. So we think hey, about- Marla, Yes, John. I, I know you're gonna cover this later, but go back that slide. I just wanna look at the total amount to re-wet our clay soils to field capacity. That's darn near four inches of water that we require. Yeah. So I know you're going to cover this in more detail, but uh, boy, that's that, that's a lot of ground for us to make up. Exactly. So what John is referring to here is if we have dried our soils down, like let's say we're actually, well, we probably wouldn't be that dry, but let's say like if we're really, really dry, we have to get up to here potentially per foot. So four inches per foot in order to actually get up to field capacity. And, and only above that would be, be in saturation where that water, it, like there's too much water in that soil essentially. Uh, and then you get into the thing that, well, clays don't flow water through. So how quickly do you want that rain to fall as well? So if we need four inches of water per foot in order to get say that clay back up to um, field capacity, we don't want four inches coming at once um, four times in order to get down to four feet. So we do have to also think about how effective that that uh, rainfall is. And we are going to talk a bit about that too. I'm going to touch on that in terms of how efficient or effective the August rains actually were for us. So when we look at that, considering what John had just uh, commented on, field capacity on a uh, these are from Manitoba soils. So a lot of the generalizations that we have around how much water can be held in the soil and such are not always coming from Manitoba soil conditions. So we do have this data 
um, that was done on Manitoba soils, looking at what that field capacity is and the permanent wilting point. And remember, the difference between these two is what is going to be here, the available water. So that's the difference between field capacity minus permanent wilting point. And if we're looking at these clays, like a Red River clay, we're looking at 12.4 inches of water that can be held in the top four feet. So if we're also then thinking about being drained completely down, that is what John was just showing was like three inches of water per foot required to get us even back up to field capacity or to be kind of a full tank. Because right now we don't have a full tank. So how much water do we need to get to a full tank? If we're, at, if we're dry, basically a near permanent wilting point, we need three inches of water per foot to get back to a full tank status. Compare that to something like a fine sand, uh, some of the Mississippi sands, which of course have a higher water table quite often as well, um, but some of the finer sands that we might be farming on maybe in the Carmen region, that type of thing, it's a lot less water that that soil can hold. And so to get back to the full tank, it takes a less to get there. But again, the tank is so much smaller on a sand versus the clay. So let's go back to this map quick and try to put all this together because I want to look at what some of these colors actually then mean. So we're generalizing again because there's soil textures that change across this, this uh, whole province. And when we're looking at this map, we have to kind of think about what that texture is to determine what very dry, dry, optimal, wet, and very wet actually mean in terms of numbers. So we're looking at dry and optimal as kind of our, our two kind of dominant colors here. So if dry, the orange means that that soil is between 25 and 50% of available water in that soil. So essentially the tank is 25 to 50% full and that's it. Optimal is somewhere between 50% to field capacity, 50% of available water to field capacity. So it's somewhere in the 50% to full range. Again, full means as much water as the soil can hold. It doesn't mean that the soil is saturated or over wet. So as an example, if we've got Red River clay, we know that that available water for a Red River clay can, in the top four feet can hold 12.4 inches. That means that if this soil here in this kind of general area is dry, we only have three to six inches of water in that top four feet of the soil that is available for crop uptake. There's a lot more water actually in there, but it's held so tightly the plant can't access it. But in terms of available water, it's only three to six inches that's actually there primed up for next year. So let's compare that to a New Dell clay loam. Um, let's go over into the, kind of this area in Manitoba and look at these kind of clay loam soils. A little bit different, again, available water in a clay loam is 10.4 inches. So they've got you know two inches less water holding capacity essentially in there. Um, so now because they're in the optimal range, somewhere between 50% of available water to, uh, to um, full field capacity, there's somewhere in the realm of five to 10 inches of water available for crop uptake in the top four feet in the New Dales. Okay, so that's just a general kind of statement. Again, we can only generalize when we're dealing with a map like this. Some people will have more specific field data where they're looking at moisture probes in their field and be able to break that down even um, like kind of tighter because you're looking more specifically at what soil type you have and what the exact moisture status is. This is again, a generalization, but it does give us a, a, a general idea of how kind of bad off we are if we're thinking about it in that terms going into next year. So how much water does a crop well, actually well, use? Yes, John. Well, I, I just want to share one of my, my grievances. Uh, remember that that previous map is based on uh, available water under a bluegrass sod growing at a weather stations. And yes. now, now you've converted to the amount of water actually required under an annual crop that's going to root four feet. So we always have to temper those maps knowing that they're growing under a, a sod crop that's probably been dormant and asleep for half the summer. Yeah, and may and will have likely woken up in August like most of our lawns did. And so that is something to keep in mind. That being said, that is also the movement that the, the uh, US has gone into as well uh, towards that. And part of the reason, just so everybody's aware, part of the reason why these moisture meters are put under sod 
has to do with also maintenance because it um, once they have actually permanently installed them, they would have to uh, manage the crop over top every year to match what the crop looks like in the field. And in terms of not destroying the, uh, the um, equipment that's underground uh, and having people till over it and stuff like that, that's why they've moved to putting it under sod near the weather station. So those soil moisture maps are moisture sensors are put in at five centimeters, uh, 20 centimeters, 50 centimeters, and 100 centimeters under uh, near the weather station. So almost all of our weather stations, I believe now have, um, have these soil moisture sensors there. So, but again, whether we have to worry, like it's all generality. So we always have to keep that in mount, um, uh, kind of in mind in general, when it comes to all of these different pieces of information is that even if we had that information specifically for one field, the next field is still 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers away. And so the, the amount of variability that goes into the creation of maps like this, there's a lot of variability. So again, it's a general statement of kind of what things look like um, across the province right now. But yes, it's not under, they're not uh, being assessed under annual crop. Um, so when we look at things like canola, spring wheat, those are the two that I put up here, just to look at water uptake, because quite often we think about how much water or when does a crop really need water. And the water use, of course, is going to be very low. This is going to come up later on. I'm sure if people have questions about, you know, how much a volunteer weed crop or volunteer uh, volunteer crops, the accidental cover crops that are growing right now, or even a cover crop that is planted, how much potential water can they take up in the fall? So you can you have to kind of think back to what it looks like if they were taking it up in the spring. And of course, there's going to be a little bit of variation depending on what the actual growth potential is for, say, um, if you were planting canola or wheat, just because it's on the screen as a cover crop later in the season, uh, comparing that to how it would grow in the spring. So total numbers though, both of these crops can take up a lot of water. And in order to get to full yield potential, we're talking 16 to 19 inches of water that can be used then by a canola or a wheat crop over its kind of period of growth in the, uh, in the summer. So if you wanna think back then to the fact that we only had say in the Red River Valley, three to six inches of available water, but we, we need to get closer to 15 in order to actually grow a canola or a wheat crop and get to full yield potential, that gives us an idea of how short we actually are and how dry that tank is in terms of what the need is going to be for next year's crop. So I wanted to put that out there so that everybody is aware. We start looking at, I started doing the general calculations last week and it basically, when I looked at it, I thought, you know what, we're basically at this point, one crop, season behind. We've heard people talk about this. It's been on Twitter and um, when they've been talking about where we're at in the weather, that we're essentially one growing season's amount of rain or one year of precipitation behind right now in terms of how much has fallen over the last couple of years. That means we're also, in soil moisture terms, one crop behind in terms of what's in the tank. So we've shorted at this point, or we are short the potential for one year's crop. And that is something um, that makes me a little nervous thinking about next year. Now, that being said, I've seen many different predictions on what next year is going to bring, what this winter is going to bring, and none of them are the same. Um, and so it will also be very interesting to see then what we actually get for recharge this winter and into next spring. So I, I said I was gonna mention quickly how helpful were the rains in August. And this, the problem here is it depends on how it falls. We often use very general water statements where you say this much rain falls, this much is taken out by the crop, this is much coming, you know, assumed coming up from below uh, as water, groundwater recharge. And this is, you know, the soil water budget. The problem with the soil water budget is it does depend if you're looking at the rainfall addition on how that rain falls the rate of the rainfall, how quickly it comes down is going to affect how efficiently soil pores are filled. And so what we find is if you get that heavy rain, especially on dry soils, this is often where we hear of mudslides and all sorts of like flooding happening is following dry periods or on dry soils with very heavy rain, the soil doesn't soak that water up. 
The other thing is that there's cracks, uh, cracks in our soils, and a lot of our soils have those big cracks, and that allows for what we refer to as preferential flow, where water runs over and straight down the crack, essentially bypassing the root zone completely, um, depending on how deep that crack actually is. And so the process of this happening means that you can't just say, oh, we got two inches of rain. If that two inches of rain came down really quickly, most of it ran off the field, and then some that was running up and over the field went down below the root zone because it ran down those cracks. So our August rains may not have been very effective at recharging soil moisture. That is something that Timi Ojo, um, our ag modeler, has said when I was chatting with him about some of this information, he said when he was looking at the moisture data going down on those probes, they found that they could see the water moving in at the five centimeter, they could see a little bit at the 20, and then it seemed to totally bypass and they were thinking that it may have been because of some of the preferential flow that may have occurred. And I don't want to go on too long about this, but because of course I talk about salinity and we can't not talk about the lack of soil moisture and the impact that this can have on salinity, I'll just touch on this quickly so we can get to questions. Um, but when we're talking about wet dry cycles, if we are in these dry years right now, this is where salinity is increasing. If we've had moisture bring up a water table in the past, and now the water table can be wicked to the surface or closer to those roots, um, then we start to see these the salinity increasing. I was just on a, I was driving to, um, to heading west anyway this weekend and when I was on that route um, heading up through the Roblin area and a lot of these regions the amount of salinity that's being seen on the surface again it's not shocking this is again what we end up seeing when we have a lack of precipitation and more upward movement of water rather than downward movement of water so of course when we talk about what's needed to create that salinity problem we had to have had a high water table we need to have those soluble salts closer to the root zone and following wet years that will happen and then we go into the dry cycle where the evaporation that's coming off of a, a soil exceeds infiltration so essentially there's more upward movement of water than there is downward movement through to, through rainfall and this is why we end up seeing this coming up even worse through those wet period or dry periods and of course we need to have plants that are susceptible um, in order to create that problem so looking at our status and we don't have the maps yet for 2021 but of course we will eventually have these maps for 2021. AgVise puts these general maps out um, and they're showing soil samples that have salinity above one decisiemens per meter. So essentially at this point this is where crops like soybean and corn start to be affected. It's a very low level of salts, but it is going to start affecting um, those salt sensitive crops. So you can see what the percentage of soil samples testing above this are. You can also see the um, kind of trend that they show over, uh, over the years. Again, because this is something that is going to trend over time and it's not the same because those salts are fluctuating through the soil, they go up and down, but we're seeing again, this upward trend happening as we go into these like drier periods. We've seen the exact same thing not that long ago going through these dry periods, upward trend, you get a bit of moisture, some of it gets washed back down. Now an important point that I wanna make about these maps though, or this data, is that the data that AgVise is taking in is sometimes grid sample data. This is on all of the samples that they have. If it's grid sampled or zoned or, or zone sampled, they might actually have some of those high saline spots being sampled and going into this analysis. But the majority of the samples that are going into AgVise are you know, a mixed sample for one field from multiple 15 to 20 pokes per field. And when we soil sample, we avoid saline areas on purpose because you don't want to include that into that uh, mixed sample. And so, this is often showing a general amount of salinity across a field. It's not showing where the high spike areas or high saline areas are in the field and whether they're fluctuating. So it's just something that's important to point out. And I throw this into, this is a few years old, but this was when we were also seeing that past spike or um, salinity go up in the Red River Valley. So Brunel Sabrin had taken the samples um, and analyzed them to look at soluble salts in the Red River Valley and was finding that they were getting these kind of increases showing up in that 2017 year, uh, a little bit of that spike happening. Um, and then they probably would have seen things kind of decrease ever so slightly. But again, dry soils, 
uh, high amounts of evaporation coming up to the surface, lower precipitation, we end up having those higher salt levels at that time. And when people say we don't have a salt level or a salt problem in the valley, there is salt in the valley, there's mild salinity. Um, it doesn't look like a very big number, but once it starts popping up over one, it will start to affect corn and soybeans and those being big crops that are being grown in the valley, then that salinity becomes a problem. Okay, that's what I have um, to kind of get us started for the week. Uh, questions for the panelists. Now, um, as we kind of get into this and start thinking about different questions to be answered, again, put them in your question in the question tab. I'll also have a few things kind of popped up here as well. Um, I think I might be getting some text message questions coming in. Other panelists might be getting the same thing, so feel free to jump in if you're seeing something that's come in on your own uh, on your own phones. Uh, there is one question here or a comment about uh, this is to four feet how this is talking about the soil moisture data this is to four feet how much available or how much is available in the early part of the growing season and is this uh, data available and I guess this would be looking at how much of it is available in the surface because we'd be talking about early growing season or maybe it is about how much is available in the early part of the growing season for the map. Now the map that I showed was two, four feet. We also have a map to, to uh, the top foot. Okay, so we have a map for the top foot uh, as well. Both of them again are in the crop weather report. And the one thing that's nice about having, even though there's questions on whether or not the data that's coming out from these soil probes is, you know, because it's undersawed or anything like that, if that's a question. The one thing that's nice about that is we can actually at least follow some of that throughout the growing season. And so we actually have this early in the growing season as well. Before we had those, um, uh, before we had the, um, the soil moisture probes in the ground, we did the fall soil moisture survey that was done by hand. Uh, and so we would go out to the, basically the same, there's 105 locations across Agro Manitoba, and we would hand sample, dry down those samples. So we had that kind of general status right going into freeze up. Um, but now at least we can actually monitor those over time. Okay, um, question, how much recharging ability does the snow have on dry conditions like we're seeing now? anybody I, I can uh not hold i can I, marla it's curtis i <laughs> yeah, can take no a stab at that. that okay um well uh the the simple answer is that it depends and the reason it depends is because so much of it always depends on if if the ground freezes and, and it is frozen quite uh, far down at depth you're not going to get a lot of infiltration on that so some years you'll find certain soils uh, what, that are worked, uh, infiltrate and warm up and thaw out much better than, say, the zero-till uh, soils with standing stubble, and other years that flips around. And so much of it depends on how wet your soils were going in at freeze up, and then and then uh, how things melt and that. So this year we're probably not going to see a lot of frozen soil, at least at the surface, because they're so dry. So that that may have an influence there too. And that, that will be a, a big driver on how much uh, uh, water infiltrates into the soil, which is really the goal of what you're talking about and what I'm probably gonna be talking about tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think Curtis, you may talk about, it's one thing to receive snow out of the heavens, but it's another thing to have it stay in the field. And I think maybe you're gonna to comment tomorrow on you know uh, some of the stubble height and things like this, like to actually hold it on fields uh, versus to, you know, hold it temporarily on the fields until it blows into my shelter belt. Yeah, yeah, I can remember even back a number of years ago uh, in uh, Al Ridley's soil management course where he, he would touch on things like that, you know, whether it's worth putting up snow fences or, or going out and, and creating ridges, snow plowing in the fields and, and so forth. And, and of course, a lot of the data at that time showed either it was variable or inconsequential results for doing that. But again, that might be in years where you don't need to store a lot of moisture and it may not have all infiltrated the way we wanted to. But you know, now that we're in the situation that we're in, it's probably something still to consider that you may want to 
use every, any and every opportunity to store as much moisture as you can and then you hope for the best that it goes down into the soil and not run off the soil. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone remembers, uh, there was a bunch of Twitter pictures, I think in June or maybe July, about people commenting about, man, look at the variable growth of the crops out there. And I think someone had mentioned that uh, an old timer had noticed and said, well, of course, that's where the snow drifts were. And so we do see some of this variable uh, snow recharge, apparently. It's, and it's probably apparent in years that are really dry, like we just had. But uh, I thought that that was really neat how, uh, you know, some of that thing is an artifact. And if you've got a good memory, you know where those snow drifts were. Uh, it's interesting to see when that shows up uh, in the following crop. Or the snow drifts also help to keep the shelter belts alive um, because that's where all the snow ends up, right? And so that's, yeah. Um, given that and looking at some of the questions that are think comments that are coming in, a lot of the snow trap work uh, comes from North Dakota and the brown soils of Saskatchewan and Alberta. This is Byron Irvin that has posted this to our comments here. Um, and so that's also a good thing uh, to understand, like on those brown soils, uh, drier soils where a lot of this is, uh, the snow trap has actually been looked at. Um, if the rain is received, or if we get some rain just before freeze up, will this lead to lower soil moisture retention or higher soil moisture retention from that snow melt, I'm gonna say? You mean if we form a skating rink on top of the soil, uh, will we get any more water coming in? Yeah, I guess. So, so if we're dealing with, um, if we end up dealing with very wet conditions, say at the surface, or at least wet condition right near the surface, is that actually going to yeah, decrease uh, the snow moisture retention that we end up having? Yeah, it's Curtis again here. I'm I'm thinking out loud on this, so that take it for what it's worth. But I know on some of these uh, sandier soils, a lot of times in the summer months, when you when you add water and things like that, it almost looks uh, if they're really dry, it almost looks hy hydrophobic. It'll pond on mm -hmm. on a sand rather than just shoot right in. I think that's a big function of just being so dry and all those pores or so many pores are are air filled that. It takes some time some, sometimes to properly wet up that soil to get the air out of the pores and get the water moving in. So, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where if it's really dry, you're gonna have some of these uh, challenges at the initial state of trying to get water going where you want it to. Mm -hmm. So having a slightly moistened soil can actually help to increase some of that potential flow as long as it's not like fully saturated at the soil surface. And if we go in fully saturated, that's when there's no real space for anything to add in when we have that snow melt. Then we're not so concerned about whether or not um, that snow is going to be helping accumulate soil water. Then we're more worried about whether or not that snow is, the additional snowpack may end up increasing things like flood potential. Um, but having a little bit of moisture can actually help to increase that flow of water through that soil profile, um, as opposed to being completely bone dry. A uh, question had come in for crop water use amount. So the, the data that I was showing comes out of Alberta, uh, an Alberta fact sheet on um, how much water was being used by the, the canola and the wheat crop. And I've been looking at my computer trying to open it up and I can't quickly find it on my on my desktop. Maybe John can or remembers this when I was when we were looking at it. Um, but what is the yield in bushels per acre that that would have been based on? It's not gonna be the high yielding spring wheats now. Um, and I think it's probably not heavily restricted in water movement or water, right? Like this would have been yield oh. when water is available. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, uh, Ross McKenzie's comments with that. Th those they measured under irrigated conditions mm -hmm. or when water was not limiting. So that's like the amount of water that plants will use if it has access to it. Uh, of course, crops that don't have access, they, they, they would plateau off there. So, uh, but again, uh, it's a sorry example of uh, the, the lack of data that we have right now 
with our current high yield varieties. For dry conditions. And that is the reason why when you look at those maps, they have a kind of a gray bar, uh, like kind of like a plus minus idea that there is there's variability based on different conditions that were being seen at that time. So it is kind of like a variable um, showing the variability of the data, but again, under irrigated conditions. So therefore it's not, it's under kind of prime conditions. So what that crop water uptake would be in a dry season, obviously it's not going to take that what up what it doesn't have and how we relate that then to yield. I'm not hundred percent sure, but it is a very, it is a very good point. Uh, Marla, I was just going to say, uh, uh, while, while you were showing that graph, I was busy figuring, converting those darn millimeters to inches, uh, how the wheat uh, between the tillering to boot and canola through the rosette stage, which a lot of our volunteer crops or regrowth are sitting at right now, uh, says they're using about between a tenth and a fifth of an inch of water a day. And imagine that's pretty true because we've had some really hot days and uh, maybe you better bring this to light right now that there's yeah. some uh, theft taking place in our fields. Yeah, and th this becomes, and this is gonna be the conundrum that I think we end up getting into a little bit as we go into our tillage and our weed discussion and everything as we move through the rest of the week. But when you're dealing with dry soil conditions and we want to be able to leave something there to catch snow, we want to leave something there to decrease the potential for wind erosion next spring because we have been seeing these dry spring conditions and overworked fields. I'm just going to put it that way. It's overworked surface um, tillage that's happening and we've got these soils that are prepped and primed for spring planting but they're also prepped and primed well for spring winds and keeping that in mind we want to do whatever we can to have something there to stop that that wind erosion or that wind movement so having these volunteers there or cover when people talk about cover crops and things like that having the volunteer something growing there is actually going to slow that down the problem is that that volunteer crop or the cover crop that might be planted in this case is also taking up precious water. And we have had situations where we have seen too much water taken up in a dry fall going into another dry year um, and having those cover crops actually having a detrimental effect on crop growth the next year because of some of that excess water or the, the water that was like precious little there, that available water is being taken up by that volunteer or by that cover crop. So something to keep in mind when we're trying to manage that. If it's growing, it's helping to hold that soil in place a little bit, but might need to make sure that we're spraying that out. Tilling it out, maybe not the best uh, option because again, we don't want to blacken that soil. And we don't want to increase the evaporation from it as well. But if we have an opportunity to spray some of that out, that might be something that uh, Kim will touch on on Wednesday as well. Um, comment had come in or question, I guess, regarding what we were talking about with this crop water uptake and how much is actually taken up based on that Alberta data. Do you think that in excess, if there was too much water or enough water, will a plant take up more water than required? Is it like diminishing returns? Is there a point where if a, a crop has available water, does it actually take up more than it needs? John's just sitting there with this look on his face like he doesn't want to answer it. I don't want to answer that one either. You got a bunch of soil people trying to answer crop questions here. This is great. Yeah, well, uh, it, it does involve a lot of things in, in, in regards to, you know, what what is the, uh, the, the water use is driven by uh, uh, transpiration. Yeah. And so the hotter it is, uh, the windier it is, uh, the more conditions favorable for growth, uh, it will uh, exert that uh, that pull on the uh, uh, on the soil water. Uh, yeah, often Manitoba, we're cursed with more water than enough, and then we end up with uh, excess or saturated soils and reduced growth that way. But and um, yeah. we also have dry, like less or more humid conditions, which may decrease some of that transpiration potential too, and that push or flow of water through the plant. 
And again, that might be another thing looking at this data, like it's great data to be able to look at, but there's again, a, a lot of generalities that come along with it, but being in Alberta, even if it's under irrigation, drier conditions, drier air, less humidity, there's more potential for that water to pull through that plant because of that transpiration potential may be increased in that case. Um, Marla, did, yeah. did you just want to make a comment? What one of the, uh, sometimes this, this checkbook type thing about figuring out how much water we get and how much water is used, it doesn't add up well. And some of it's because of the uh, capillary rise that we see in Manitoba. You might want to mention that to some of the people further west that don't have the high water tables we do. Yeah, so, and this is something that we saw in what, 2017, 2018? Um, where we had a dry year, not as dry as we've seen right now, but we had a dry year. We had something like four to five inches of precipitation and we're getting these amazing corn yields off of four inches of rain. Um, and that is because we had high water tables that were driven by the wetness that had occurred in the years prior. So when we are happy to have those high water tables, they are feeding that crop from below. They're also bringing the salinity up potentially as well at the same time. But when we have those water tables that say in a clay soil are within four, five, six feet, even yeah, six feet of the soil of the surface, um, that capillary rise through those tiny, tiny little pores that allows water basically to kind of move up or be sucked up towards that root, uh, that root zone, that can be very beneficial for actually feeding or sub-irrigating a crop, subsoil irrigating a crop. And so we, we do see that in years where we have that water, uh, water table potential to pull up. The drier we get and the lower that water table becomes, the less potential we're going to have in dry years for that water table to be feeding from below. But that is an important thing when we think about how water is moving upwards and look at that crop water balance, we don't just think about that precipitation, we're also thinking a bit about that capillary rise and potential for water to be flowing upwards and feeding the crop from below. Uh, okay, comment, uh, I'm gonna go back up through this here. Uh, adding to the crop water uptake should, I just wanna comment on this one quickly, should we be looking at managing water uptake through fertility practices? So is there soil fertility practices that we can be considering that can actually help to, to manage crop water uptake? I'm going to throw this at you, John. You might not have an answer for this. It might be a simple answer. It might be a, a long answer. Um, but I, I wanted to throw this at you because we are going to get more into fertility practices later on this week. Okay. Uh, I guess the simple answer is yes. And uh, the the nutrient that's uh, most commonly referred to is potassium. And because uh, if potassium is short in supply in the plant, uh, the stomata, and I can show here, the, the stomata that regulate water loss or flow through the plant, if we have low potassium, those stomates don't slap shut fast enough and they continue to bleed water. And that's why uh, well nourished with potassium, the plant can then turn the top on, turn it off uh, more uh, uh, regularly in order to, to match the water supply. So that, that one is a textbook example. There, there are other things, uh, uh, you know, moisture conditions really affect nitrogen under dry conditions. We often need more nitrogen per bushel produced than under moist conditions. And I'll, I'll show some data on that. But uh, yes, the answer is that, uh, yeah, some fertility uh, does directly affect the, the, the crop's growth. Nitrogen, I'm, I'm gonna do a bit of a test, uh, or maybe I'll put it up there earlier, Marla, but the, the question I'll put in there is the term haying off. People can Google that up and find out what it is, but that is a case where excess fertility can go bad under dry conditions. I'm told that sometimes happens in Saskatchewan, but frequently in Australia, this hanging off phenomenon, I'll talk about it uh, Thursday. Thanks, John. Yeah, and like I said, we've got, there's so many different aspects of this. So there's a lot that we can uh, have a chance to talk about, which is why we wanted to make this a multiple day event uh, this, this year. Um, 
Uh, we've been noticing in fields with volunteer crops, with the morning dew, the field is sopping wet and it sticks to shoes until about noon um, and the water is kind of falling on the soil or stubble from those morning dews. But in the sprayed out fields, the ground is dry. So are the volunteers not helping a little bit in order to keep moisture or gain, I should say, gain moisture from the morning dews? Uh, good observation. Um, and it might be, okay, I'm, you might be seeing some of that moisture kind of affecting that surface, but in terms of what might be coming out from that, that volunteer, I guess it depends on like how many millimeters of rain are dripping off of the plant onto the soil surface versus how many millimeters of water, soil water, are coming out through the transpiration potential of that plant. Anybody else have a comment on that? Uh, I have just a short one, and that is uh, years ago visited a research station in Ohio where they thought that they were able to measure water accumulation through the dew, but at the at the end of the day, it was just equipment malfunction. The equipment tends to measure it, but no, it had no effect. And so uh, I'd be thinking if it's looking damp, it's uh, fairly temporary uh, and certainly no long-term accumulation. Yeah, and I also wanted to add to this too, um, one of the phenomenons, I guess, that's coming along with this open and very warm fall that we've had through September, A, we're probably getting a lot faster growth of these volunteers just because there's more heat to accumulate in order to grow them. But there's also then, along with that, a higher rate of evaporation and transpiration potential. So when we talk about and we'll Curtis will talk about tillage tomorrow and talking about you know how much water is actually lost through evaporation per tillage pass how much water is lost through you know things like if we're talking about the transpiration through a plant the potential right now is a lot higher or through this fall so far has been a lot higher than it normally would because of the heat that we have we've got drier air hotter air increases that rate of evapotranspiration, right? So we also have, even though there might be some of those dews adding a little bit of moisture to that surface, there's a lot more potential for the evaporation to come off of that field or through the transpiration of the plant. Um, we're gonna be in the higher range than we would normally think about being in the fall, just because it's been so hot through this fall. Uh, in a normal year, okay, so in a normal year, how much of the yield comes from in-season rain and how much is coming from the soil's capacity uh, coming into the spring? And I don't have a direct answer for this question either because it in what's normal really at this point, we don't really know what normal is. Normal is a 30-year average um, and that 30-year average changes every decade uh, as they roll into what the new normal is. And um, and so it's kind of hard. I don't know what the exact number would be in this case, but the soil's capacity. So if you think about again what that potential is for how much if you're going to go through a basic crop water balance, if we think about how much rainfall we normally would get in a growing season and compare that to say a crop needing 12 to 15 inches. Let's go a little bit lower than what we were looking at from that Alberta data. So 12 to 15 inches of water in order to actually get to full yield potential. We don't get 12 to 15 inches of even rainfall throughout the growing season. A lot of that water is coming from the soil and that soil's ability to feed that crop. And so um, when we go through dry spells and the crop is still growing, that's because again of that potential for that available water coming in and we haven't had a lot we normally have decent if not too much recharge in the fall that's been our reg, our new normal lately has been having some wetter conditions in the fall and having ample soil moisture going into the spring and this year is one of those years where we're not seeing that so that is what worries me as somebody who works in the area of soil and soil moisture and soil management uh, going into next year is the fact that we don't have the, the feeding potential from below going into next year's uh, growing season. Uh, John, Curtis? Yeah, uh, it's Curtis there. Yeah, that's uh, John's rule of thumb about a third of an inch of a water per acre per day used by a crop. Usually it's uh, in, in mid season when things are growing, but that's a good rule of thumb. You know, if your soil stores approximately 10 inches of, of water, 
in that uh, profile, then you've got a month's supply of water stored. And a lot of soils could be half that. Uh, and, and then, of course, you've got other things going on there like uh, salinity or high water tables that could uh, throw an extra wrinkle into that. So um, one of the other things that often comes up, we've talked a little bit about monitoring uh, soil or soil moisture, like how we actually determine how much soil water there actually is. And again, the maps are a general statement of what might, may or may not be available kind of regionally. Um, but John is sending me a note reminding me here to talk about the brown probe. Uh, and so um, I don't know how many of you own or use a penetrometer and I you know that if you know me I end up talking a lot about compaction in, in my day job as well and uh, and I often will say that I don't care for a penetrometer as a tool because the penetrometer doesn't tell me everything that I want to know about a soil structure and how that might be affecting um, affecting things like compaction. One of the other things that it doesn't tell me is how moist that soil is or how much moisture is available in that in that soil so I prefer a shovel. And um, so given that, if anybody has seen a brown soil probe, and I don't know, John, do, what do you have one in your office somewhere that you're wanting to hold up on camera? Probably not anymore. It was in the corner, I knew that. Um, and uh, the brown soil probe essentially is, um, looks like a penetrometer. It's just a, a narrow probe. You press that down, it's kind of got a ball bearing end on it. You press that down into the soil and essentially, as deep as you push it when you hit the like hit dry soil down below it will stop moving and this is the reason why i'm always concerned about the use of a penetrometer in dry conditions because sometimes we assume that that means the soil is compacted but actually it means that the soil is dry um the brown soil probe is very well used or has been historically well used in like saskatchewan alberta again where we don't have that same moisture coming up from below not something that we often see used so much in manitoba because our moisture profile is sometimes a little bit different, especially again, if we've got water coming up from below and so it's actually sub irrigating or sub uh, wetting the subsoil below. Um, but John, do you have other comments that you want to talk about with the brown soil probe? You take that thing and you stick it in the ground and when it stops moving down, that is where you've hit a dry soil zone. Again, it doesn't yeah. tell you how well, much I, 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 I like it because there's no batteries required and I don't need a GIS guy to measure it. Uh, and uh, and yes, because it's less simple, Henry, it's simple technology uh, that even John Hurd can handle using. That's right. That that the other thing is, uh, we had our soils tour this summer, and we 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 toured at a place with a very sophisticated high yield farmer, and he has weather stations in his field, and what he uses is is a probe. Simply, yeah. uh, if I can push it in the soil. I know I've got moisture there and I've got yield potential. And I, I think sometimes going back and using some of these simple things, and this can go right back to one of your earlier slides, is that some of these brown probes have a little auger tip or drill mm -hmm. bit at the bottom. So you push it in and you can pull it out and it'll hold some of the soil on there. So you can see if it's clay or clay loam soil, it's holding more. If it's sandy, it's holding less. So it, it does have a scientific premise to it. And uh, yeah, no batteries or no GIS technicians required. Yeah, it's, it's kind of nice. Yes, Curtis. Yeah, uh, if you want to add to that, like you want to go slightly more quantitative on that, uh, page 39 in the soil management guide or wherever that is on online there, that's the uh, table on determining available soil moisture by feel or appearance so it's again not necessarily getting you yep not getting you to uh, uh, multiple decimal points or anything like that but you get some guidance there as to how to practice up based on what soil texture you're dealing with and it also tells you how to hand texture if you if you need to know that first but at least then you get a bit of an idea the irrigators do this all the time you know needing to know am i at field capacity or half of field capacity or am I at the dry end you know and and getting an idea of of what you've got there is that does the soil form a ball can you squeeze any free water out of it and things like that which helps I guess do the same thing as the brown probe but maybe takes it a step further 
I think Curtis, you may have an old version of this book. It's page forty-four. I probably do. One with the two thousand and eight version. Yep, I probably have the old version. <laughs> but yes, and it's also available if you Google Soil Management Guide Manitoba, it'll pop up top of the list. Um, you can download the full PDF version, or you can go in chapter by chapter online. Um, but yes, uh, the other comment that I wanted to make is back when we used to do the fall soil moisture survey, we actually, um, prior to having the instrumentation in the field, we hand augered to four feet in order to take these samples. And so we had them, we brought them in, we, we oven dried them. It went through, you know, the, the whole process of being able to figure out what the exact amount of water was, uh, in each soil. And I can say that if you were in the Red River Valley, hand augering to four feet when it's dry and you're down kind of near that permanent wilting point is next to impossible, um, no matter how big and strong you are. And so, uh, so when you know when you hit those dry soil conditions and even with the little auger tip, it's a little bit easier that with the smaller auger tips that are on that brown soil probe, um, but yeah, it, it, is, it does give you a good idea then of what the actual moisture content is and then comparing it against a, a general table like this can be very helpful. Um, we are at 9.26, so we're coming to the end of our hour. Uh, our panelists, does anybody have any last comments that you want to, uh, to make regarding this or what people can expect uh, the rest of this week? Uh, I just want to remind people that if they have questions, they haven't had a chance to get answered here, send them to Marla and we'll queue them up uh, and answer in the next couple of days. Absolutely. I will put my email address in here so that everybody knows how to find me. Mm -hmm. uh, Curtis, any comments? No, I think that's good. That's good. I'll, I'll save the rest for tomorrow and uh, we'll go from there. Sounds good. So I uh, have also, yes, John? By the one reminder for uh, people looking for CCA credits, do you want to mention how that's automatically logged? Or I do have the QR codes here if we need to post them. Yeah, we. so uh, again, for those of you who are CCAs who are looking for those all important soil and water management credits, um, we have logged that. So when you registered, you put your uh, CCA number in with your registration form. And what happens is that at the end of the day, uh, the people who are working and logging this program um, behind the scenes, they go in and check. And for the people who attend it, then you will automatically be entered for or have your CCA number put forward. If you did not attend in person and you're watching this right now as a post recording that's going to be posted, um, you can also get your CCA credits in that way. You can self-report them then with, uh, with the Prairie CCA board. Excellent. All right, well, given all of this and not wanting to keep you guys dragging this on uh, beyond our hour, thank you everyone for your attention today. Thank you for all of the uh, questions that have come in. And uh, and we were, are going to um, be able to answer even more of them as the rest of this week goes on. So again, we will see you here tomorrow, 8.30. And we're going to start talking tillage and soil erosion with Curtis. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.